lots of things to talk about today. And one of the first things that people often ask me is how did autism help me understand animals? I get asked that all the time. When I was a little kid, I had no uh, speech until um, age four. And it helped me understand animals because I'm an extreme visual thinker. Everything I think about is a picture. I don't think in words. And you want to understand animals, you got to get away from words. That's the first thing that you need to do. And this is a picture that a young autistic man sent to me to show how he had movies in his head. Getting a little dated here. Old 16 millimeter film, but it really shows it. Because no picture, no thought. So what I want, the first thing I want to get you to do is be more observant. What is the horse looking at? What is it hearing? What is it feeling? It's a sensory-based world. It's not a verbal one. And when I was young, I thought everybody thought in pictures. When I started my very first work in the cattle industry, it was obvious to me to go and look at what are the cattle seeing when they go through the handling facility. They'll stop at a shadow, a coat on a fence, a vehicle parked next to a fence. Little things that we tend to not notice, the cattle noticed. And then later on, when I got into my 40s, that's when I f completely learned that I think differently. That most people don't have such extreme visual thinking. In fact, when I do my autism talks, I talk about some of the different kinds of specialized thinking. Photorealistic visual thinking, that's gonna be your mechanics. I do bring a lot of talks now to educators. There's a tons of jobs fixing airplanes, fixing cars, fixing diesel trucks. Good jobs, not gonna get replaced by computers. And yeah, don't bother studying oncology. You're gonna get replaced. <laughs> You'll get replaced by computers. Dermatology, don't be bothered. Radiology, I wouldn't be bothered. <laughs> fixing airplanes, I talked to a kid last night in the airport. He, was, he shined my shoes, really nice kid, high school kid. I said, you know what? Why don't you get a two-year degree to fixing these airplanes? You'll have a really good job for life. So I'm kind of going back and forth between a lot of different things now and uh, doing a lot of talks with educators. There's a lot of kids that are different who are super good with animals. Dyslexic, ADHD, mildly autistic. I have seen this over and over and over again. Now in my cattle work, here's an example right here, of cattle being blinded by the sun and not wanting to go in the chute. And people are back there whacking on them and everything else and they don't understand why. It's just like being blinded by the sun when you're driving down I-70 straight east. Been there, done that, it's not fun at all. So you might want to change the time of day you're gonna load that horse trailer, not right when the sun's shining over it. Now I've showed this picture uh, to a lot of students. I took this a year and a half ago when we had the um, partial eclipse here. Those are eclipse shadows on the sidewalk in front of our library at Colorado State University. And all the tree leaves acted like little tiny pinhole cameras. I noticed the weird shadows. I didn't know eclipses did this. And I go, wait a minute, there's something really crazy here about the shadows. And then I realized it was little pinhole cameras. I watched students walk over this right on top of this and not notice. I was also shocked at the lack of interest in the eclipse. They gave away like 20,000 pairs of glasses with the word science spelled wrong on them. That was kind of embarrassing. So about a third of the students were interested and the others were not interested. And the eclipse was at its maximum right when classes changed. And they just couldn't be bothered. Now, Here's another example in a cattle handling facility at a ranch. As the cattle come up here, they can see a reflection on the car. You might wonder, why my horse was fine at home, now he's going nuts at the show. Well, you can get odd reflections on things. Uh, one time I was talking to some people about a show where some draft horses went berserk when a garage door had gone up in the Coliseum. And that garage door had been opened many, many, many times. But maybe that day there was just a reflection on it. Little things that move, that are sort of like they shouldn't be here, those can really scare animals. A common thing that people will say to me, 
Oh, my horse was fine at home and he went berserk at the show. I hear that over and over again. Think about all the novel new things you got at a show you don't have at home. And the big three are flags, bikes, and balloons. And they're scary because they move in an erratic, rapid kind of manner. Let's get your horse used to this before you go to the show. And don't shove it in his face. Let him just gradually approach the flags. Chains hanging down in chutes. I still have to talk about this. Why do I still have to keep talking about this 44 years later? Because people are not removing them. Now, I've got checklists in my book of all these things. But I guess it's going to give me job security. I had real fun time last year. Landed in Dublin, Ireland, and we went out and we rented this big, monstrous black helicopter and landed on the front lawn of this beef plant. And their cattle wouldn't go through the chute. And they could see motion through about uh, six inch wide holes in the, in the gate. Six pieces of duct tape later, I had it fixed. <laughs> That's all I did. And then we took off in the black helicopter. <laughs> yep, that, that actually happened. That was, too, that was recently. So I guess that gives me job security. That was a fun way to do it. <laughs> this shows you a place where maybe you might need a solid barrier because as the cattle came up here, they could see the trucks loading. Here's a dark hole, sunny outside, real black inside. And the horses and cattle often don't like to go into that. They'll go in great at night. You can use lights at night to attract an animal into a trailer, but that's what I call the dark movie theater. So maybe what you gotta do is put in some white translucent panels so they can see through the building. Now, just to show you how specific visual memories are in an animal, there was an experiment done in Germany by Leonor and Fent. And what they found is they train a horse to tolerate a blue and white umbrella just suddenly opening, not afraid of that. Then they thought, oh, well, we can just flap a tarp around, that's gonna be just fine, no. The tarp is treated like a totally new object. Tarps look completely different than umbrellas. Now, there's some photographers that have those umbrella light things. Now, that's probably enough similar that they'd be okay with that. But sensory-based thinking is specific. Verbal-based thinking is not. It's a picture. Better get them trained to a whole lot of stuff. Now, I don't think it's going to make any difference whether it's the American flag or the Colorado state flag. I really don't think that's going to make a difference because they're enough the same. They're the same shape and they have contrasting colors. And animal thinking is specific because it's sensory based. An animal will often get afraid of something it was seeing or hearing right when a bad thing happened. I went to a Mustang training program that was being done at a, at a prison and the horses were terrified of the guards because the guards wore cowboy outfits. They wore Western outfits. The prisoners wore scrub suits and sweatpants and sweatshirts. So they were the good guys, and the guards were the bad guys. And the guards didn't like it when I told them that they were the bad guys. But the thing is, it's, the thinking is specific, and the prisoners had always been really nice to the horses. Sudden new experiences, they're frightening to both animals and people with autism. You could have the calmest horse, but might have a high-strung genetics, and everything will be fine until a hot air balloon lands in the pasture. And that's when you're gonna see the genetics. Where you tend to see flighty genetics is when you suddenly shove something new in the animal's face. And then I met a racehorse uh, named Run Happy, and when three Air National Guard helicopters fly over the pasture, he stares at them and all the other horses run off. He thinks Air Guard, National, Air Guard helicopters are fun to watch. I put something just simple in the middle of a pen full of cattle, they come up and sniff it. Then when the paper moves, they back off. I used to call that curiously afraid. See, they'll both approach it, and then when it moves, back off. 
there's actually a switch in the brain that can switch back and forth between fear and approach. You've all seen a deer orient, and the deer looks, and it points its ears and its eyes. And now, when the deer is orienting, the brain makes a decision. Do I keep watching, or do I run off now? Or maybe I'm going to just start grazing. Now, I had an experience that really showed this, how this orienting system works. Because you can either go seek or approach something, maybe it's scary, or you can run off. Well, I was driving on the freeway, I-25, and an idiot with a little low trailer, like the kind they put lawn equipment on, had a three two-by-sixes about this long on the back of the trailer, and one of them slid off. Just as he passed me, there's no way I'm going to stay behind a trailer that's got loose two-by-sixes on it. No way. So as he passes me, the, tr the board slid off, and the board, I locked onto it like radar, and the board was floating. I had the perceptual slowing that Sullenberger talks about when he uh, landed the plane on the Hudson. He had the same thing, because when they played the flight recorder back, he was shocked at what a short period of time it was. But the board was floating, like two inches above the freeway, coming up, and I locked on, and I moved over, and went onto the rumble strip, and I did a perfect straddle of the board. Then the switch flipped. Heart started to pound. Swear words came out, lots of them. And I'm not going to describe the swear words, but I use them to describe the board, the trailer, and the driver. <laughs> but I went from seek to fear. The switch flipped. It was like instantaneous. And then it took me half an hour to calm down. So if your horse gets really, really upset somewhere, it takes half an hour for him to calm down. So you go into the vet and you have a big mess with kicking or some other bad thing. And one of the worst things you can have at vet is a slippery floor. Animals freak out on a slippery floor. Like this floor right here would be horrible. I wouldn't want to have a horse on this floor. Now, I've done some brain scans and I found out that I've got a huge visual thinking circuit. I didn't know everybody wasn't a visual thinker. Big visual thinking circuit. But the problem is I'm not able to do algebra. So some of these kids that can't do algebra are getting screened out. You don't need algebra to fix diesel trucks. What you need is old-fashioned sixth grade math, or to train horses for that matter. And I'm seeing a lot of smart kids getting addicted to video games. I was very happy to hear about this new um, horse council study. It came out in 2017 on young people getting interested in horses. I think it's just great. Kids are getting, uh, getting away from just constant electronics. And that brain scan right there shows uh, no working memory. A lot of kids that are different cannot remember long strings of verbal instruction. So any task that involves a sequence, like maybe how to make some feed or whatever, give them a pilot's checklist, step one, step two, step three, and just give them some key words. This is my different kinds of minds. I'm a photorealistic visual thinker, can't do algebra. And there's scientific research that shows that what I'm telling you is not a bunch of hooey. I have a book called The Autistic Brain, and I've got the references in there. Then you have the pattern thinker. They are your computer people. And uh, they don't see risk lots of times. That's why you have messes like Fukushima. They didn't see the water going into the basement and drowning the electrically operated emergency cooling pump. Then you got the verbal thinker. Everything's words. And then some people that are dyslexic, uh, they have problems with reading because the print jiggles on the page. Some of these people are super good with animals, but they're going to learn in school through their ears. Now, here's the horse that was terrified of black cowboy hats. He was a BLM Mustang, and during the freeze branding process, he moved around, so somebody threw alcohol in his eyes. And that person that did that was wearing a black hat. And I describe this in my book, um, Animals in Translation. White hat's no problems, black hat's scary. Now, when I put the hat down on the ground, it was less scary. But as I took the hat and I got it closer and closer to my head, it got more and more and more scary. You see, you're getting a match. Now, what I'm kicking myself that I didn't do is I had this big black round purse that was about the size of a cowboy hat I think if I put that on my head, it would have had the same effect. It would have looked enough the same. 
because it can generalize some. Another place where I've seen generalization is horses getting afraid of a certain type of bit. There's some horrible bits you can buy online, awful twisted snaffles that will cut up a horse's mouth. Now, if that's been used on a horse, all jointed bits become bad. Jointed bits go in a bad category, and if you, sometimes you can fix a horse that has this problem, so it's just taking a one-piece western bridle, it's all solid, no moving parts on it, and he's fine. Because it's a different feeling picture. I had a horse when I was in high school named Sizzler, a beautiful horse that my aunt bought from a horse dealer, and he was just great, but he bucked when you went from a trot to a canter. Now, why did that happen? Think about it. A saddle's a different feeling picture at each gate. Now, what I would have done with him now, he was a Western horse, I would have trained him English. I had a complete English outfit, but I didn't know the things I know now. And I would have gone out and bought the weirdest saddle pad I could find because I'd want to open a new file. You see, if I can make the feeling picture enough different, it's like opening a new file in the horse's brain. The other thing you've got to watch for is you see that tail starting to switch. That's your warning that he's heating up. Heads up, eyes get wh eye white, really scared. Tail switching, then pooping, because you scared the poop out of him. <laughs> but I probably could have fixed Sizzler with, by converting him to English, because you get at something enough different, you act, is, this is where you have an advantage with specific thinking. Another thing that should have been done with this horse that a horse trainer recommended is you want to turn on that system to approach. Maybe you get a 50-foot string and start dragging the hat along the ground. Turn on the approach system. Also, I talked to a lady who'd started doing some clicker training with a very badly abused horse that she got. And I described clicker training in my book, um, Animals Make Us Human. And this is a rescue. You couldn't touch it. You couldn't put a halter on it. You couldn't put it thick up its feet. You couldn't do anything with this horse. So she started training the horse that the click was associated with feed. And very quickly, she was picking up the feet and leading it. It worked. Yeah, calm animal, a whole lot easier to handle. Uh, people are now starting to really recognize the importance of reducing fear. And people will say, well, the horse is excited or agitated. No, he's scared. It's fear, and fear is a proper scientific word. And one of the things that's being done in veterinary medicine right now is what's called fear-free for all animals. Let's work with them in such a way that when we do medical procedures, they don't get scared. And the first thing is give them a non-slip floor to stand on. That applies to your dog, too. Now, a good friend of mine, Camille King, she's one of these really hard workers where she just goes out and does really wonderful um, research projects. And she noticed in her dog behavior pr practice that a lot of young dogs were turning gray before they were four years old. And so I helped her make a little chart for assessing how much gray they had on the muzzle. And dogs that would jump on people, scared of noises, scared of unfamiliar people, more likely to turn gray. And I think one of the problems today is a lot of animals are leading to shelter to life. They're not getting exposed to enough stuff. We never had thunderstorm phobias when I was a kid because dogs were out exposed to many more things and we didn't have all the dog bites. Yep, I just read about a dog bite at the Portland airport, bit a five-year-old in the face, suing the Portland airport for a million bucks, real mess. This brings up another thing with your dogs. We've got to socialize puppies and teenage dogs to toddlers. Toddlers are people too. If you don't specifically train them to toddlers, they don't realize that toddlers are people. Fear. It's the main emotion in autism. And I found out from brain scans that my fear center was three times larger than normal. It's now under control with antidepressant medication I've taken since uh, uh, 1980. And if you want to read about that, it's in my book, Thinking in Pictures. That's available online. I'm sure the Amazon warehouse over here has got plenty of copies. <laughs> this, I thought, was an interesting uh, research on dog genetics. When animals go into the animal shelter, the animal that has the low fear personality, in other words, bold, not afraid, less likely to get sick at the animal shelter. 
because he's not getting so scared and upset about being alone and being in a strange place. Do animals have emotions? Yes, they do. And I really like the work of a scientist named Jack Panska. Let's just look at some basic science here that shows that animals have emotion. Prozac works on animals. The neurotransmitters are the same. Now, when you're thinking about what's motivating your horse, dog, or any other animal to do something, these are the seven Panskep emotional systems. You can have fear. Usually, when you have a problem with training a horse and he acts up, it's not rage. Rage is what enables you to fight off the predator. We had this case recently in Fort Collins where a half-grown mountain lion uh, tried to kill a student, and rage had kicked in. He was fighting for his life. Get that cat to finally uh, strangle the cat by standing on its throat. Then you have separation distress. You take the colt away from the mom. That's a different emotion than fear. Fear and separation distress, they're not the same thing. And a lot of animals have a lot of problems with being alone. Then seek. Some dogs will really chase the ball. Other dogs don't. Uh, that's also the same thing that turned on when I managed to not hit the board. Then, of course, you've got sex. You've got the mother young nurturing, licking. And then you've got play. So kind of imagine these seven traits on a music mixing board. You've got seven slots. Both genetics sets it and previous experience sets it. Both are really important. And you can have high or low fear cows, and it's a separate trait from aggression. You can also have high or low seek. GPS collars were put on cattle. I think you'd find something similar in horses. And some animals would go out and graze a lot of pasture. And others just laid around the water hole. They were just lazy. Some cows will climb up the hills. Others don't. And there's genetics involved in that. Let's give animals a non-slip floor. That puppy's in a brace position. I show that picture to veterinary students, and most of them don't see it, that puppy's in a brace position. That's not very comfortable for the puppy. Now, some other very interesting research is the work of Gregory Burns at Emory University. He's got a fabulous book about training dogs to lay still in the MRI machine so he can study their emotions. And the reward circuits are very, very similar to people. And they smell their favorite person, their reward circuits light right up. So yes, they do have emotions. But what they don't have is verbal language. So things are going to be simpler. I was talking recently um, to um, Heather Thomas-Smith, who writes for the Western Livestock Journal, and she asked me about pain in animals. Yes, you, cut, you castrate cattle without painkillers. Yes, it hurts. Definitely it hurts. And horses and cattle are a prey species animal to cover up the fact that they hurt. So sometimes you've got to like spy on them with video cameras. Then you can see what they're doing. And a prey species animal is not going to let on that he is hurting. And, but the thing that the bull doesn't know, he doesn't know what he's losing. <laughs> then when he becomes a steer, he, he's not going to be the king of the herd anymore. He doesn't know that. Now, some other interesting things with dogs is that uh, olfactory or visual associations will learn more quickly than just verbal ones. Animals such as cattle and horses, vision's the dominant sense, especially on things that they're afraid of. Do they feel pain? Yes. You can cause a joint to be irritated, either naturally with arthritis or inject something into it. Chickens and rats will self-medicate for pain. It absolutely shows, yeah, they do feel, feel fear. What do dogs need? We've we have bred dogs to be this super, super social animal. And then we leave them at home all day and they're chewing up the house. <laughs> the other interesting thing is there's crossover between autism and animals. There's a really interesting paper called Solitary Mammals as a Model for Autism. Solitary Mammals as a Model for Autism. Lions are more social than panthers or leopards. There's genetic crossover there. Another mind blower of a paper is genomic trade-offs. Are autism and schizophrenia the steep price for a human brain? The same genes that make the brain big also cause autism and schizophrenia. 
Making a big brain is kind of a difficult thing. And in autism, you might get extra circuits back here for art. I've seen beautiful art just like I've seen here at this show that people with autism have, have done. Yeah, they need to be getting it out in places like this show and selling it. Do thunder shirts work on dogs? It seems to work the best on the separation distress and it um, works better on dogs that are not on medication. Does have some positive effect. A lot of people ask me about my squeezing machine. When I got into my 20s, I started having horrendous, horrible panic attacks. Exercise helped calm it down, and another thing helped calm it down was deep pressure. Deep pressure is calming. There's a rear view picture. Also, you can see I'm pretty good at skilled trades because I built that all myself. And I've got another new book out that's on Amazon, uh, Calling All Minds. It has my childhood aviation projects on it. And they're going to have to tinker to get it to work. Kids are too afraid to make mistakes today. And I think part of this is they're too far away from the practical world. See, a brain can be more thinking or a brain can be more social-emotional. Here's the paper on the solitary mammals. And then there's another syndrome called Williams syndrome where the children are super friendly, maybe not very intellectually gifted, but super friendly, crossover with dog friendliness genetics. It's the same genetics. This is what's interesting. In autism in the mild form, it's just personality variation. Compared to wolves, dogs will look to people, since we've bred them to be hypersocial, to help them solve problems. A wolf is more likely to go out on his own and figure out how to get a box open to get some food out of it. The dog's too busy asking us to open it for him. <laughs> the same genes that give humans a large brain may also cause autism, schizophrenia, and epilepsy. I think that's really interesting. Now, the basic principle I want to get across in this slide is that when you force an animal to do something, just force it, you get the most fear stress and the cortisol is going to go up the most, and it's going to go up the highest in the animal that has the flighty, more excitable genetics. And when you train animals to cooperate with things like veterinary procedures, then you don't get all of the stress. And I did work with the Denver Zoo, and when we did this work, it was 20 years ago, people thought Nancy Earlbeck and I were completely crazy because we were going to train antelopes to voluntarily cooperate, go into a box and get blood sampled, and get injections. Now, since this animal is super flighty, we had to go through a long period of training it to just a sliding door opening. Because if I'd opened that door quickly, they would have rammed into the side of the barn. So the first day, I moved that door about two inches, and it goes like that. It orients. Well, that's all I did that day. Next day, it was four inches. It oriented. Because if you push it past that orienting, well, he's going to go into fear mode, go splat on the wall. Now, we finally got these animals trained where you could bring veterinarians in off the street. They could handle them. But the person who had shot them with the dart gun could never handle these animals. Also, one day they were out in their paddock, and the people came to fix the roof, and they went berserk because that was something completely new. They weren't trained for people on the roof. That's something that's different. Good stockmanship matters. People that are super good at working with animals, they don't get enough pay, and they don't get enough credit for what they do. And there's a lot of kids out there that might be doing um, badly at school. They might be called at-risk youth or whatever. The best thing they could do is get out there with horses. I got kicked out of ninth grade because I was bullied and teased, and I threw a book at a girl who called me a retard. So I went to a special school. And for the first three years, I ran their horse barn. Didn't do one lick of study, but I basically was responsible for the horse barn. And I look back on that, I was learning how to work. I'm seeing too many kids that are different today getting babied. They aren't learning shopping. They aren't learning money. They aren't learning any basic skills. Make sure an animal's first experience with something new, like a horse trailer or an arena, is a good first experience. Because if the first experience with something new is a really terrible experience, they don't forget it. Because after all, an animal that's living in the wild, let's say I went up down this canyon and I went behind this rock and there was a lion there. 
I might not want to go there again. I might want to avoid that. And there was an experiment done by a scientist named Miller where they had a thing called a radial arm maze, which is sort of like a wagon wheel. You drop the rat in the middle and it's got corridors going off like this. Well, if the rat goes in the first corridor and you blast him with a shock, he'll never go in there again. Then he goes into the second corridor and gets chocolate chips and goes, oh man, I'll go in there. Then he goes into the third corridor and he gets a little tiny tingle of a shock. He goes, oh, those chips were good, it's worth it. Goes in the fourth one, a little more shock. He goes, oh, those chips are so good, it was worth it. You can actually work them up to a pretty bad shock and you'll still go in there. But you have that really horrible first experience. That's a real bad scene. And I'll also be less fearful of something new if he's with a familiar person. Having a familiar person with them often help with stuff that's new and getting them to tolerate it better. Dogs and horses, they make categories. For example, when I'm walking on the leash, I protect, and when I'm off the leash, I can go play. Horses and cattle will make categories between a man on the back and a man on the ground. One of the issues you can have with Mustangs is you can learn to, they ride just fine, but they're horrible for groundwork. Because in the past, all of the bad experiences were on the ground. Cattle can do the same thing. If they're only handled by a man on horse, the flight zone just might be from here to this screen. But the first time they see a man on the foot, the flight zone's from here over there where the sound equipment is. Because a man on a horse and a man on the ground are two totally different things. They've got to be trained for both. See, this is why I want to get you thinking in sensory-based thinking. There was an elephant at a zoo that was terrified of diesel-powered equipment. If it ran with a gas engine, that was fine, and if it ran with diesel, it was bad. Because somebody probably had pushed him around with construction equipment. That's probably what had happened. Now, when you're a sensory-based thinker, you're also a bottom-up thinker. Here's a picture a young man sent to me of putting cats and dogs in different boxes. Sensory-based information, pictures or sounds, are put into categories. It's bottom-up. Word thinking tends to be top-down. Now, for me to learn something, it's all bottom-up thinking. Everything's learned with specific examples. A word thinker, if I say, think about a church steeple, they might just say, point anything. I see specific ones and I start naming them off. There's one in Fort Collins, it's the giant stainless steel cross. That's one that doesn't look like a regular staple. Bottom-up thinking, animals, people with autism, and guess what? Artificial computer intelligence is also a bottom-up thinker. I've been following this really, really carefully and watching which jobs are gonna go away and which jobs are not gonna go away and high-end skilled trades aren't going away. Somebody's got to fix the self-driving trucks. And even if they have a self-driving school bus, I don't think the parents are gonna want it unattended. <laughs> or if I've got really expensive freight, they're not gonna wanna send it across the state lines without a person in it to attend it, because someone's gonna spoof the uh, sensors and rip the truck off. Now, an animal is not completely tame has kind of a safety zone. Completely tame horse hopefully has no flight zone because he now is completely tame and you lead him. But a wild Mustang, if you had a whole herd of them, you'd see a flight zone. It's just like you see here in this shape. And that's determined by previous experience and genetics. You enter the flight zone, they move away. But you can see there in the back, there's a tan animal looking at me. You'll see horses do this, especially ones that aren't like fully trained colts move away, and then um, they'll look, turn and look at you. There's kind of two zones. You want to get an animal to go forward, walk back by it. You want to get behind the point of balance, and when you're working in the round pen, you're just behind the point of balance, going around in the round pen. This is the same principle as cattle. So how did I get my business started when I was really weird? selling my work. I just stopped by the booth of the gorgeous, gorgeous horse photography over here. Absolutely fantastic. She started doing some pictures at some shows, maybe like this. And what I started doing was gradually working my business up. Because the biggest thing that I'm doing right now is I'm doing a lot of talks, parents, educators, and I want to see all these creative kids that are different get out and be successful. 
So where do you start? I started my business on cattle handling stuff, one small project at a time. 30 second, wow. Okay, I walked over by her booth and I'm going, oh, wow. This photography is just fantastic. And I showed off my drawings. It's a drawing I did in the mid 80s, one of my hand done drawings. This is the drawing that I used to sell Cargill on designing the front end of every Cargill beef plant in North America. I think that's doing pretty good for somebody who thought was mentally retarded. <laughs> and I really appreciate you clapping about that. But nobody thought I was going to you know, amount to much. And one of the things that motivated me in the 70s and in the 80s is I wanted to prove to people I wasn't stupid. That was a big motivator. All right, I want you to raise your hand if you saw that that animal was looking at the sunbeam. Oh, we're doing good here because you're horse people. You're doing a lot better than the school administrators do. <laughs> the only group that's done better when I've shown this slide has been little kids, third and fourth grade, and zookeepers. I just did zookeepers recently. Now, I do a lot, there's a lot of people doing workshops. It's really good, all the things that are going on. Cattle handling, low-stress handling, natural horsemanship, all of this stuff is really, really good stuff. And what used to get me really frustrated is I go out to a place and we get their cattle handling really good, then a year later it had lapsed back into bad, and they'd slipped back into some old rough practices and they didn't realize it. The other thing I have found is people want the magic thing the magic piece of equipment more than they want the stockmanship and the management side of it. So when I first started, I made a big mistake. I thought I could build magic self-managing cattle handling equipment. No way. No way. And that mistake's still getting made. People go, oh, we put a laptop in every school for every kid that's going to make the school wonderful. It doesn't. Things like teaching, nursing, these kind of jobs, they're not going away. People still want to interact with people. Live theater's not going to go away. People are still going to want to watch that. So we started measuring handling. This is some data that one of my former students collected, some feed yards, some very nice numbers on things like falling down, electric pride use. It used to be 500%. I got it down to 5%. 20 years ago, I did my project with McDonald's Corporation, and I get asked all the time, how do we deal with things, you know, and treat animals better? And I took McDonald's executives on their first trips to farms and slaughterhouses, and I saw reactions that are just like that show Undercover Boss. <laughs> they were shocked when they saw some bad things. In fact, Bob Langert, the person I worked with, has a uh, book called The Battle to Do Good. It's called The Battle to Do Good by Bob Langert. He's the person I worked with. And when we first started 20 years ago, though, the plants, they were awful. And the main thing that was wrong with them was broken equipment and lousy management. It was ma it not fixing things. Now, then I got the power of Wendy's and McDonald's behind me, really cleaned them up. And since I had a vested interest on selling equipment, I did reverse conflict of interest. And out of 75 plants, only three had to build something expensive. Everything else we fixed with management, maintenance, repairs, and simple changes like lighting and non-slip flooring. Now, this is the original slide from my research that we did on temperament and cattle. People thought I was nuts to look at how much cattle jump around in squeeze chutes and whether that be related to weight gain. It was. It's been replicated. Now, the issue I'm concerned now is over-selecting for traits in animals, whether it be a performance trait like speed, or an appearance trait in horses. And you over-select for any one trait, you're going to get in a pile of trouble and get into a really bad case of bad becoming normal. Well, purebred Brahmins, you treat them right, they'll treat you right. They love to be stroked. Now, don't pat your animal like this, stroke it, stroke it. Don't do this, stroke it. And there's a study where a horse was stroked on the withers while you're riding it. And it likes that a whole lot better than just kind of than just pounding it like that on the shoulder. Now you've got to figure out what is 
the really important things to measure. I do a lot of stuff on, you know, how do we maintain animal welfare? Well, you've got to look at what's important. And that's in food safety. It's called a critical control point. You've got to figure out what are the really important things to measure. Kind of use the principle of traffic. All right, let's just see how good you are at the critical control point approach. If you were only allowed to enforce three traffic rules, which three traffic rules would you enforce for maximum public safety? Stopping? Yes, that's one of them. Speeding? Yep. No. But I, how, how about drunk driving? Okay, drunk driving, speeding, stopping, texting, and um, seat belts. The, and the top three are the most important. The reason why I didn't put seat belts in the top three is they protect me. They don't protect you against me. You see the critical control point approach? What is really important? Obviously, if your horse is all covered with sores and lesions, that's terrible. Or it's lame, dirty, starving, no, things like that. No, that's not okay. Now, lameness is a critical control point because this is the cattle list. But it's a big list of all the stuff that can make them lame. And the horse is going to have a, you know, some of it's the same, some of it's different. But you'd measure lameness. Leg conformation, we've got a big issue in cattle right now where <coughs> people are breeding for meat and the leg conformation is terrible. Or in horses, breeding for speed and the bone's snapping. That's an example of over-selecting for a single trait. Hideous steer at our Colorado State Fair two years ago. That was a bull. It wouldn't breed very many cows. It could barely walk. There's a hideous, awful pig that's genetic. Nice floor he's on, but a hideous foot. That's another defect in cattle. You see, the problem is traits are linked. So you blindly select for a trait. So you start getting something like corkscrew foot, which is something you definitely don't want. Now, I want to just show you an example of how traits are linked when you blindly select for a really simple trait like temperament. Years ago, the scientist Belyaf, like 50 years ago, 60 years ago, wanted to breed a fur fox that wouldn't tear your hand off. Now, you see how lean and snarly he is, pointy snout? 20 generations of select for nice fox, you get heavy set border collie fox dog. You've changed the shape and the color. Why is that linked to just selecting for a nice fox that licks your hand instead of tearing it off? Traits are linked. And you know what? This is still not understood, even today. It's not understood how these traits are linked. Deer, 30 years ago, you could not get in a pen with farmed deer like the way we are there. There's no way. They would be on top of you, striking you cutting you all up with your hooves would have been impossible to do this. That's 30 years of selection for temperament. Well, I've got to trash the bulldog. That's what it used to look like. Then you got the, this deformed freakazoid. <laughs> That's a deformed freakazoid. It can't breathe, it can't walk, and it can't have its babies naturally. Now, in 1938, you can download this picture online. It's called Bulldog's Dilemma. Look, it's a totally different dog. How did you get from between those two things? Well, because the breed standard just says massive head. I've looked it up. But where do you stop on massive head? It would have been better to have had that picture maybe to be the breed standard. All right, now I've got to gross you out. Hideous horse picture. And I only learned about this about two years ago, and I was horrified. And you type into Google Images, Extreme Arabian Horse, you will find a whole bunch of these pictures. And how anybody could think this is pretty is beyond me, because I don't know how it's going to breathe. This is bad becoming normal. We've got to look at the quality of life. And I think if you can't breathe, it's not going to have a very good quality of life. And looking at animal welfare issues, the first thing you have to do to prevent is to prevent suffering. But then is your animal really having a good time? Does your horse ever have a chance to get out and be a horse and just run around? And there are my books, and of course they're for sale. 
Okay, well, I just want to thank everybody for coming, and thank you for coming. <laughs>